and welcome to 10 Very Big Books, a Malazan read-through podcast. My name is Peter Bond. I've read each book in the main series. However, my two co-hosts are reading the series for the first time. With me today is my friend and closest confidant, India Jones. Hello. And bodies are disappearing around town, and I don't know if I can trust him. It's Joshua Dean Baker. You'll never find them. I am the ultimate hider. <sighs> I gotta be honest, I've got no opening. I completely forgot to think of something to say, so... Josh, it's always you. It's always me. Um, so my thought of the week, I texted this to Peter. I, I almost had, I thought I I had So this week I told Peter a fun fact about Memories of Ice. Um... Oh, that's the opening I wanted to use! So I texted Peter, and I, we're only, listen, we're only six chapters in. But I did claim that this may be the greatest book I've ever read. And I said it was a tragedy that in order to enjoy the book Memories of Ice, one must read Gardens of the Moon. And uh, it's truly, truly one of the darkest things about this series. So that's my two cents. You can't get mid- you can't get Memories of Ice without Gardens of the Moon, you know? I fully agree. I mean, I think, I think it's such a treat, and I think the rest of the series is great too, but I do know what you mean, and I think that's it's tough to sometimes thread the needle of like, Oh, I don't like maybe you're not going to like the first book, but some of the other books are worth your time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a tough sell. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's complicated because and that's why when people tell me they like Gardens of the Moon, I'm like, awesome. This is all good news for you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Only up from here. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, I don't know. Let's let's start the show. Chapter four. Harlow and Stony Monacus are carrying the carriage across the river, whilst Gruntle watches Buke approach Botulin and Corval Brooch. We hear about Buke's family demise and his tragic past, and he returns to share tea with Gruntle. Buke will help guard the two strangers. He believes these two to be responsible for a series of murders in Daruja Stand. Quick Ben consults with the Witch of Tennis about the sickness that has taken the sleeping goddess Burn. Outside Pale, Captain Parent unites Quickben and the Sorcerer Spindle. They reflect on the Battle of Pale, and Parent thinks of his sisters. They reach Caladan Bruins encampment, where Whiskey Jack greets them. Parent meets with Dujek, and the High Fist delivers news from the Empire. Parent's parents have passed. His sister Tavor ascended to the Adjunct, and his sister Felicin sent to the Otatural Mines. Perrin meets with Whiskey Jack, and they discuss Silver Fox. The child awaits meeting with Perrin, but the captain is hesitant to meet Tattersail, reborn into a child. They also speak of Nightchill, and her being a soul taken. Silver Fox has also given Perrin a new name, Genesad Rule, Wanderer in the Sword. Perrin only concedes to meet her after learning that Kalor wishes to kill the girl. Sergeant Ancy's squad, Spindle, Blend, Dederon, and Trots, sneak into Caladan Brood's camp to take back the bridge burner's table. On the bottom side of it, a strange, unaligned image of a figure with a dog-headed chest appears. Spindle starts making a painting of it. North of Pale, Perrin and Silverfox meet at sunrise. Silverfox urges Perrin not to be afraid of her or the Talani Mass. Silverfox speaks of the Deck of Dragons and the houses within. The houses of the deck reflecting ancient holds and perhaps Azath houses. They consider Azath houses being gates into different warrens and consider how Kelenbet ascended to the Throne of Shadows. They then speak of Animander Rake and High House Dark. Perrin has dreamed of a child within a wound and Silverfox urges him to run towards it. Perrin has entered the Deck of Dragons represented by a new unaligned card, the Master of the Deck. Perrin rejects this title, turns to see his companions watching him. Quick Ben offers him advice, but he declines. 
In the next chapter, too, we spend a lot of time in Caladan Brood and the Malazan's uh, encampment, learn all about the politics of the army before they go south. But before we do, we touch in with Harlow and Stony Manakis before we kind of really focus them on chapter six. Uh, so we learn more about Buke's past as he kind of globs on to Corbel Brooch and Botulin. And uh, how do you feel about touching in with the caravan guards? Well, um, these are the people that are curious about the the murders that are occurring right yeah buke is like kind of leads the suspicions yeah i i i'm really um interested and i guess like we could talk more about that in chapter six but i think that they're interesting characters i guess i have a feeling that like in chapter six we read all about them but i'm still kind of wondering where they fit into this grander scheme i still don't get it um maybe that's just me but do you mean the grander I, scheme of the of the, whole book. Yeah, yeah, of the yeah. whole book? Because like it seems to be they're going like one way and the whole book is going toward the Pinanian domain. Yeah. Min. So I'm just I don't I just don't get their point yet. But this this I say this about a, a group of characters in every book. So I'm sure it'll all make sense to me soon. I feel bad um, about his whole family dying and. Now he kind of like wants to die, <laughs> like in a in a noble way because he didn't save his family. I guess I think is what his whole no. That's like his, is. He's like yeah, it's sad. It's sad, but like, come on, guy, it doesn't have to be like that. But I hope that they. I'm intrigued to see what what comes of their whole situation. What what comes of um this whole like I don't know. What, what, whatever they're looking for, I, I just don't, I don't get it yet. So yeah, and well, how it fits into the story, but they're fun. They're cool. Do you It'll know, be interesting. I think we're going to have such a chance to talk about them in chapter six since it's so yeah. focused on them. Um, exactly. So, so Josh, let me ask you then, uh, quick Ben, um, speaks with a witch of tennis, uh, and really is starting to think more about the sleeping goddess and um what's your vibe on on quick ben i think this is our first time especially in the first book uh, we, we is kind of more in the shadows feel like in, nowadays we're, we're spending more time at this point of view as he's kind of thinking about what to do with the the sickness that's ailing burn um well first i mean it's pretty interesting is to like get to actually spend some one-on-one time with quick ben like you said he's he's usually in some ensemble roles in the first book um I'm curious why he feels like this is something that he and only he can work on, you know what I mean? Like, why he's not cluing anyone in at this point. Yeah, he actively omits it later on. He does, yeah. It, it's interesting. Um, And also, let's talk about, like, where, how there's just a random witch here who, like, lives <laughs> in a hovel and people pay her and she's like... Ooh, witch stuff, and just like, and and why does he trust her? Like, I mean, I guess she's good. She's very I, I old. Know. She's a witch. She's I don't very old and a witch. Where's and her credibility? If there's two things a witch has to be, it's very old and a witch, and then you can trust them. That's true. Yes. Um, but is she know, citing I'm, academic journals? Isn't that the question? You know, preach, man. Is Chicago style MLA <laughs> what we dealing with? So, I guess I don't know. I'm interested. I I am curious if this is going to be something that like we start here and like we kind of like india said we have a lot of things going towards the panty and Domin. so like is he going to be the whole time just like i'm killing hordes of the panty and Domin. i wonder how burn's doing in this moment of brief like you know like is mm-hmm, that gonna be how it is mm-hmm. or is he gonna just kind of like let let this to the side and like figure it out three books from now who knows do you think quick ben's crushing on burn is that what you think it is what no <laughs> she's a little she's the <laughs> earth I, I was just, it was a joke, Josh. I was just... How is she? I just, I'm so fascinated by her. Oh, I have a lot of questions. I forget who... Oh, Perrin is... Th- Perrin learns about it when he's in the Azath. It's like, it's like... Yeah, that was weird. She's like the love. Oh, yeah. She's like Strange the love of time. Yeah. Well, let's, start, let's chat about that later, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, Burn's cool. I'm into it. Inja, the next part, we see uh, Perrin think about his sisters, and then he learns about his sister, and we also meet the sorcerer... Uh, with the hair, with the hair vest spindle. Um, so funny, so funny. Tell that me, hair vest. Tell me why. Um, spindle's funny. I really enjoy his character and the whole fact that he allegedly wears a shirt of his mother's hair. And he is, plays, <laughs> he plays into that rumor. I don't even know if it's true or not right now. It is the fun and like, like he stinks. I just think he's just a hilarious character. Yet refuses to wash the shirt, but. 
what I don't even remember the question that just got me so excited um but oh parent finding out about his sisters yeah that was kind of sad I didn't realize that he always like that his that uh what's the the middle sister hmm? Tavor? Uh, Tavor well I didn't realize that Tavor was always like more of a um I don't know like less familial and just kind of all about elevating herself which is what it seemed like but then I couldn't tell if he was saying like she would definitely protect Felicity because she's like for the family or she would do what's best for herself because all she cares about is the empire. Mm -hmm. So can you shed a little, if if possible, can you shed a little more light into that? Because he did mention like, she'll definitely look after the house, but then she didn't at all and just went on to send her sister, which I think he mentioned that, or maybe I don't remember who he was talking to. Um, Whiskey Jack, I think. I think Dujak or delivers Dujak? the news. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Think, yeah. And they're like, well, he probably, she probably sent her there so that she wouldn't die and like definitely plans on getting her, her soon. Which is alluded to when we find out that what's his face? Um, Bowden. Uh, Bowden. No. Who? Yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. When we find out that he's a Talon and yeah. like they're watching over her, then yeah, that's definitely kind of alluded that she was going to help her eventually, but she was there for quite a while. Yeah, and then she left. I think it's I think it's interesting this point because it's the first time, especially after Deadhouse Gates, um, where we learn so much about Tavor, but it's from Felicen's point of view. Just so to say, it's biased is I mean I don't know obviously right. So I think it's interesting to see the conversation about Tavor from the other siblings' point of view. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's 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 kind of rooted in Ganoes's perspective. Yeah, I feel bad. He I I he's. The guy has a lot to deal with as it is with his his whole uh, tummy troubles. So <laughs> tummy troubles. <laughs> um, you know this. He this does have came some tummy as, issues. I feel like he wasn't really expect. Like I don't know if he was expecting it or if he wasn't expecting it, but it's it's shitty nonetheless. Yeah, and both of his parents are dead. So well, I mean, what are you gonna do? I I, I don't even know what to what, how what? to respond. <laughs> 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 I guess that's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. Um, Josh, just the way the cookie crumbles. Perrin then meets with uh, Whiskey Jack, and they have a whole conversation about a lot of stuff, including Silver Fox. And then we also learn about Perrin getting this new name, and it's this first time uh, we hear about him, maybe his rising power. You know, um, out of nowhere, of course. Well, how did you? How did you find? Uh, I guess we'll have a chance to talk about it all episode, but how did you feel at this point about Perrin's reticence to accept this power? He needs to stop being uh, a weenie and, like, listen, man, if you're getting told, listen, you got two options. You can ascend to godhood, or you can just have so much anxiety about it that your stomach eats itself. Like, I would say ascend to godhood seems pretty good to the alternative. I, Facts. I, I just want to caveat. I know it's it's. I don't know if it's godhood, you know, but it's um. It's, it's like, something hood that is not dying from anxiety. It's power. It's of power. Some kind. It's certainly power. Are you too you know? scared to accept power, Peter? I mean, mm, right classic. now, I, right, yeah. right now, if Peter the offer was to ascend into the deck of dragons, I'm probably uh no thank you on that particular offer. I might have like two questions, and then I'm taking him up on it. Yeah, but well, like, what about the dog chest? You know. The dog chest? I'd like you to... Can somebody, like, really, really make an image of that for me? Because I, I can't picture it. What are we talking about? The dog chest? I guess I What's have an the image, dog chest? but... The, that's, like, the later when they find the picture of the master of the deck on the bottom of the table. It's, like, a, a man with a dog on the chest. Uh, it's described somewhat like that, yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't get that. This is actually the perfect time to mention, too. This is the first time we actually see the bottom side of the table because Sergeant Ancy Squad sneaks in, and this is our first time building up the table, which is obviously going to play a bigger part in the next chapter. Uh, more important than the table, so these bridge burners are the bridge burners I was promised in Gardens of the Moon, and all <laughs> I can say is I'm here for it. What do you mean? I Gardens of the Moon, everyone's like, oh, the bridge burners, the legendary soldier. And like, they talk about like their exploits and their, and their you know, they kind of talk about their goofs. But in book one, they're just so serious. It's almost like they keep getting sent on suicide missions and have become morbidly depressed about it or something. And now, and also there's like six of them. And it keeps being alluded to that there's more than six of them, but we yeah. only meet the six of them. It's true. And now we get all these new ones and they're awesome. I love all of them. They're all great. 
so that's just my take. I love these. I love these bridge burners. They're they're wonderful. Yeah, I do know what you mean. It's like nice that it kind of fleshes out. I don't know. The second squad of them does make it seem more than like yes, there's another seventy off screen. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. These I you th- my, these are my other friends. They go to another school. You wouldn't know them. <laughs> yeah. That's what it feels like a lot in the first book. Inge, at the end of the chapter, Perrin and Silver Fox meet. They speak about the Azat. They speak about Perrin's rising power, and they speak of the Talon Imas. How did you feel about this, let's say, reunion between the two characters? It was sweet. Poor Perrin. He's, like, so confused and conflicted, which I totally get because, like, it's super uncomfortable that the love of your life is in a six-year-old's body, ten-year-old's oh, body. Oh, yeah. Very <laughs> odd. And she's just talking like they, they're just picking up right where they left off, which is even more awkward. But yeah. beyond that, it is mentioned that there are three people, not two, in this child. And then it's like, but no, there is two. But then, then they also mention Bellardan. So I need to understand what that means because okay. – I'm, it's I'm either a tr- two or three. It can't be both. I'm trying. Okay. So the three people that are within Silver Fox are first off Tattersail, who Correct. is like the biggest uh, personality of the three from what we met. Okay. So far. So far. Well, then there's Night Chill, who is described as being pretty cold towards others and kind of distant a lot. But it's also alluded to maybe she's centuries old and also like ultra powerful. Who knows? There's there's some there's some weird stuff being said about that. A lot of questions. Right? They want to investigate her in the next chapter. Yes, they do. So and so she's in there and probably because she's typically more cold. It's like the t- the the tatter sale part of the personality is the one that does most of the human interaction. But then on top of those two is Bellardan. Bellardan was the big guy who was married to Night Chill. Right. And he's the one that uh, stopped Tattersail and their fight caused them all to burn up. But he was like, literally his whole personality in book one was like, I am big and quiet. Also sad. And so he's just not coming out much because he's big and quiet and sad. And he doesn't need to come to the top of that often yet. I'm actually going to jump in and say, Josh, uh, you think you've got some things turned around because... Um... Disagree, but I'll, I'll you know. No. Sustained. You're... Sustained. First fight of the episode. No, Either you're way. just... I think, you know, it's not often that Pete's going to come in with the facts, but Pete's, like, feeling pretty confident you're 100% wrong. So, oh, okay. Shit. In the next chapter, I believe, the Quick Ben probes for Bellardin. And, um, maybe it's Quick Ben. Missed maybe. that. Uh, the, they probe for Bellardin, and they conclude that Bellardin only exists in the memories of Night oh, Chill. Oh, that's right. That so is right. So they did right. say that. That is right. But it's right. kind of bothersome to me that they keep then refer, that they refer to him at all. Because, like, why are you confusing me? Why? Yeah, and I think at the end of last chapter, they noticed that they, they are openly questioning where Bellardin got off to. Yeah, that's true. That's right. So. Whatever. Fine. Fair. Um, well, then it seems that Nightchill's pretty fucking strong if they think that Bellardin was in there for some point, uh, if her memories are, are that potent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, I thought their conversation confused the hell out of me. They talked about the deck of dragons and how that was related to the Azath houses and all of and the people. And I have I, truly, Peter, that scene... It, it's setting up for me to understand something and like i think obviously they go a little bit more into it in chapter five which i still didn't get when he went into azath house but what the hell was she talking about josh if you'd like to jump in again and let me know for which I, thing and that's not and i'm just gonna say now that's that can't just be a me thing it was an extremely confusing conversation well there's like a it's like a lot of lore and exposition that's coming out in this this conversation about maybe the nature of the Azath houses and the powers that they are channeling, you know? Mm. Josh, how much of this did you make sense of? Can, specifically, what are we talking about? About, um... So, and oh, you, you um, take it. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll clear Of course I will. Um, Perrin and Silver Fox, when they're discussing the, the deck of dragons and the relation to the Azath houses and... Oh, I feel pretty good about it. Um, though, it, I, I, I feel good about, like, the back half of it. The back half being, like, and the parent thing kind of solidifies it. But, like, it really seems like there's just, like, places of power become a place of, like, become sort of, like, a thing that the deck of dragons sort of represents, if that makes any sense. That's kind of the idea I was getting out of it. I don't understand. Like, well, we saw that, that obvious? Why is she telling us this, like, we... 
didn't freaking already know that. That that's well, what we didn't know is that each of them corresponds to a specific house within the deck. Yeah, like I had made the connection that dead house. Oh fuck, is the house? It leads to the creation of the house of shadow, which is an offshoot of the house of death. Right, because because well, darkness, yeah, I don't know, I don't know it's, fucking it's, it's death not, and then it's, shadow. It's not an offshoot. That's like it's an open question for the record. Oh, got it. Okay, so it's not an offshoot, but like I guess their idea being that like the dead house should have been originally for like Hood because he's like the leader of death, but they like decided to find an older house that is unused. I don't know. I like I have it. Like I understand what they said. It's not like I could then extrapolate and make you know predictions off of that in the slightest. I'm just kind of like here for the ride. But like I thought that once you go in, you can't come out. Um, no. You have to either you either well, okay, two like, three things. Like invited in. Three things. So sometimes it seems like you get in and then you just fall asleep for all eternity, like fucking Vul- Vulcan. And that one guy, uh, yeah, yeah. Malik Nam. Malik, Malik Nam. Yeah, those two. And then, like, the girl who we met in Dead House, who was, like, related to the first sword under Kellenved. Dasim yeah. Altor's daughter. Yes, they were. Look at this oh motherfucker God, with the Peter. names. So, like, sometimes you just fall asleep. Most of the time, you go through and they're like, Sup, you're gonna be an ascendant. You know, that's like the, the Shadow shadow Throne and Dancer, or what's his name? Cotillion. Cotillion. Yeah, that's and what they dancer. do. Right? And rope. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so you have those three, right? That's how they do. And then sometimes you are uh, our boys, Mappo and Akarium and Fiddler in the gang, and you actually just get to leave. But that one seems the one that happens the least amount of the time. Yeah, I think I think you're mostly on it. It should be noted that, um, you know, Tremolor is uh, is corresponding with the House of Life. and uh, Yes. The Azath House and Darugistan is correspondent with the... The hold of ice. So this is um, too much. Yeah, yeah it's a lot, India. There's a lot I going just, on. I like kind of get it, but I also really kind of don't. I'm gonna <sighs> I like like when it comes up next, I will feel okay about what they say, but I don't know what's gonna come up next. Yeah. Mm. But this is Oh, and then please. and then they do also say that all of the houses are linked. Yes. Whatever that means. Meaning what? <laughs> but that was but well, that was they're... established in Deadhouse Gates when they travel from Tremolor to Malaz City via de, via the Azath. You thought I remembered that, huh? <laughs> Remember they're like walking through and there's like the big tile floor and some tiles are missing and they're like looking on the world map and they're kinda like seeing different places they could go almost. Uh huh, uh huh. Okay. This wasn't too long ago, Inge. Yeah, well, all right. Uh all right. <laughs> um Josh, do you want to read the yeah. next? You want to read the next summary? Yeah, I'll do it. Hi. It was. Sorry, it, I can't... It, it was a trick, India. It's really long. I got him. Oh <laughs> damn! It's so <laughs> long. Fuck. <laughs> damn oh. it. <laughs> All right. Chapter five. On the road, Talk and his companions make camp. Lady Envy draws a magical bath for herself, and we learn the names of the Segula. Tool helps Tok make arrowheads, and they speak of those who chained the crippled god long ago. Ascendants like Anamander Rake and Kaladan Brood. Tok is surprised the Segula serve Lady Envy, and speaks to the youngest one, Sanu. The Segula are a warrior people, and these few have come to this land to war against the Panian Domin. One of the Segula attacks Tool, and the two duel. Envy watches, amused, and withholds healing after Tool triumphs. She scolds the Segula to remind them of their place, and then heals the rule. Quickbend confers with Whiskey Jack and Mallet about their next moves. They think Perrin's blood has been linked with the hounds somehow, and that the captain may be on the verge of ascendancy. They wonder about the true identity of Nightchill as well. Whiskey Jack orders Nightchill's identity investigated, and for them to push Perrin towards ascendancy. Whiskey Jack then confers the Dujack about the campaign. They might not see Moonspawn until further south, that coral. They also speak of Kalor's threat against Silver Fox, and they wait for the emissary from Darugistan to arrive. The Maib and Kaladan Brood discuss Silver Fox further. Maiba has probed inside to try and learn more about Nightchill and the souls that occupy her body. 
They both agree they want to support Tattersail's soul dominating the body. They leave to meet the Malazans. The emissary from Darugistan arrives, led by the magnanimous Kruppa. Shortly after Kruppa is Counselor Cole and Counselor Da'arl. The counselors offer to send Kruppa away, but Kaladin Brood says the man is needed. When the Darus arrived, another meeting is called. Perrin and Cole recall their first night meeting at the Gondrobi Hills. Afterwards, Australia and Da'ar laments the difficulty of an overland supply train to support the campaign south. Kruppa then suggests the Tirgal Trade Guild, who would be able to supply the campaign through the use of warrants. Crone flies from the discussion of logistics and ends near Sergeant Ansi's squad, where Spindle is doing a reading of the Deck of Dragons. A new, unaligned card is in the center. Then, Obelisk, Soldier of High House Death, Magi of Shadow, Captain of House Light, and Assassin of High House Shadow, whose card now bears Kalam's face. The Maiba leaves the tents, knowing Silver Fox is asleep. Outside, she speaks to Perrin about what Tattersail was like when she was alive. Corporal Picker sees Perrin and recognizes him as the new card. Before sunrise, Perrin sees Whiskey Jack. Kruppa continued droning on about the trade guild, so Whiskey Jack left. The Black Marinth are to drop the bridge burners off near the Bargas lands, where Trots will lead an envoy to them. They are then to march south towards Kapistan. Anamanda Rake arrives as a black dragon to land in the camp. The leaders gather to meet Anamanda Rake, and Kalor speaks first. The High King calls for Anamanda Rake to kill Silver Fox. Anamanda Rake says the camp needs him to decide. However, Kaladan Brood does not wish him to unsheath Dragnipper. Whiskey Jack rides in front of the Son of Darkness and plants his sword between him and the child Silver Fox. Anamanda Rake attempts to use sorcery to probe into the child. However, Silver Fox repels the magic. Anamanda Rake reaches for Dragnipur. As Brood, Whiskey Jack, and Kalar reach for their own weapons. Just then, the tent explodes with a table and Kruppa is tossed into the air. As the bridge burners prepare for the Marath to arrive, Perrin is drawn to the confrontation. Seeing his own visage on the flying table, he falls over in pain. Silver Fox snaps the table legs, and the table now faces the crowd. Quick Ben says it is a massive card from the deck and examines the table. Once again, Perrin finds himself in the Finnist house. Ralik Nam and Vorken are still asleep at the door, and Raced greets him. They travel downward, and Raced tells Perrin he has been chosen to be the master of the deck. Raced shows him a room with carved images of the houses of the deck. Perrin travels into one, and finds a cold tent of animal hides and bones. Inside are twin thrones, with Imas skulls. It is the hold of beasts, once the seat of the Imas power before the ritual of Talan. Perrin returns to the Finnist house, and sees a burning figure on the card of Burn. Perrin learns that Kaladin Brood's hammer contains the power to wake the sleeping goddess, but he has refrained. If Brood were to free the crippled god, it would end life on the world. Perrin steps back, weeping, and wants to go home. Perrin wakes up back in the camp. Silver Fox greets him. She had drawn him there. Perrin thinks he and Silver Fox will meet again at the second gathering of the Talani Mass. Anamanda Rake agrees that he should wait to act until more is known about Silver Fox. The standoff ends, and Kruppa is hungry. The Maiva slips away and pleads with the spirits of the Rivi to die. She feels so drained by Silver Fox and is beginning to hate her daughter. Corlat intervenes and stands by the Maiva's side. Kaladin Brood and Anamander Rake speak about the new unaligned table. It will be carried by the Rivi. Perrin must stay with it. Kalor yells at Whiskey Jack and then threatens Quick Ben. The wizard opens up a hole underneath the High King. Days later, Whiskey Jack and Quickben speak of the Grey Swords in Kapistan, Silver Fox, and the strange probings Quickben has done. Then the army starts to march.
Well, thanks for doing that summary, Josh. By a little long one. But um, at the top of the chapter, because mo- once again, most of the chapter is spent at the encampment. Um, but at the top of this one, we check in with Tok and uh, the motley crew that is traveling north. How'd you feel about uh, learning more about the Segula? Um, seeing a little more of Lady Envy, you know, checking in with the, this whole squad. I, I think this this plot line is, like, pretty fascinating to me. Like, first off, I don't trust Lady Envy in the slightest. What do you and mean? So, and it's very upsetting to me how much she is laying on the charm towards Tuck. Because, look, I love our boy Tuck, and he spent enough time in the Chaos Warrants. I don't need her to, like, fucking kill him or something dumb. Right? So, I'm glad that he's, like, really trying to stay a little bit distant, which is which is funny. Um, more importantly, again, uh, my, I, my ire at Steven Erickson never ceases. He has developed this entire truly fascinating society of warrior people just as a background for these three guys that are traveling with us. And that feels, it feels a little braggadocious to be like, yeah, that's right. I can create this just for like this fucking throwaway reason. I mean, like maybe these three live with us for a while, but like whatever. And also let's talk about the the fact that the one with the two eye slits is fully like, I am the third and Amanda Rake is the seventh. And is basically like, I have no doubt that I would fucking crush him in a fight. Like, yeah, I really brutal. like when they're t- talking about when Animator Rake visited the the island. Yeah, that's some badass shit. I I truly would love to see a fight between those two. Yeah. Inge, are you trusting Lady Envy? Where are you at with this whole crew? Um, I have no reason not to. Bold, so yeah, bold she's, strategy. She's kind of funny. I like her. I think that you know she's a strong female character. She likes I'm bats. That's true. That's true. Um, I don't really get how she enslaved those people. I still don't. They may have mentioned it. If they did, I missed it. They've alluded to her being absolutely fucking this incredibly powerful sorcerer. Yeah. I think someone even asked, or like, uh, I think talks like, I wonder how she ensorcelled these very strong warriors. Yeah, yeah. And then he was like, you know, magic. Hence mm-hmm. her bath that she is having. Yeah, when she was having that hot bath. In the middle of nowhere. Casual. Yeah, I like her. I think she's funny. Um, I like when she flirts with Tuck. I think it's hilarious. And I think that he gets so uncomfortable, which is even more funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I am interested in, though, the Segula. I think it's funny when they were talking about um, when Anna Mandarik went and he had to, like, go into his warren because he was, like, done with the bullshit. It was too much. <laughs> he retreated. <laughs> he was like, yeah, I have no time for this. So that was cool. I had a point that I wanted to make about this, and I don't remember it. Mm, was it about tool no oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. so these people they just kind of they don't speak they just kind of react like they just do little slight movements to show like i don't get how they no um, senu speaks the young one he explains kind of their whole no i know that they speak but i mean like he just attacked tool out of nowhere oh yeah that was funny that was funny and then talks like why don't they attack me and they're like you're not a threat and he was like, oh. <laughs> but, like, how did that happen? Like, why? I well, thought, aren't we all cool? Like, no? Well, well, no. When they first met, all the Segula were trying to attack Tool, and Lady Owens was like, no, 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 no. And No, I know. But then they just did, knowing that we're all cool. Was I it, guess, like, a game? Were they playing? I guess they're, like, trying to establish dominance is how I kind of view it, you know? That's incredible. I, mm-hmm. I enjoy this too much. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. It's very funny. Um... Inge, the, after this is the first time we go back to camp, and we see uh, Quick Ben and Whiskey Jack not only speaking about their identity of Night Chill, but they also are kind of wondering if they should push Perrin towards ascendancy. What do you think about them kind of scheming behind Perrin's back in a way? Perrin needs some fucking guidance, and I'm here for it. Yes, agreed. Uh, agreed, and the uh. Thank you. Thank you. He... He, I don't know. I don't know why he's like. I just want to be a normal boy. Like you're not. You're not a normal boy. We're <laughs> in this situation now, and you've been in. You've been in some shit. So I don't know why now you're having all these these doubts and stomach pains. And I think that he needs that that for that like push toward decision making because the kid can't make a decision, and the decision Preach. that he's making is not right if he does make the decision. So mm. I, I don't think know. That, no, of course, you're, tell me why, Peter. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, I get it. You know, he's he's having a hard time and maybe he should just be allowed to have a hard time, you know? And he is. And everyone's aware of it. Nobody can get past his hard time. We're all so aware as he doubles over in pain publicly all the time. <laughs> 
Well, that was a, that was, I wow. think the doubling over in pain was a heightened circumstance for the record. <laughs> Josh, I guess you two wish we are pro this pushing. Yeah, fuck yeah. Parents parents uh, uh he's indecisive as fuck. So like give him get, get something done, please. Well, afterwards please. then we see Whiskey Jack go and talk to Dujek about maybe the next time they'll see Moon Spawn. And then they also speak a little bit about Kalor as they wait for uh, the Darrows to arrive. Mm-hmm. Yep. How do you feel about, I know we'll see Animander Rake later, but how do Can you feel about- Can we discuss what Moonspawn is first? It's the big moon base that the Tisty Andy live on. Now, I recall, is this one, sorry, said that she wanted to swim in the- Yes, yeah. that's the <laughs> thing that she looked at. And you guys told me that she couldn't because it wasn't real. No, no, that's, I, I said that I thought that passage was metaphorical. It is very metaphorical. There's no oceans on the moon base. Yeah, I, that, I think that. Have you been there? Yeah, it's made of cheese. We've talked about this. <laughs> you can't have oceans on cheese. All I was going to say is, how do you feel about the moon base kind of going south ahead of the army? But, like, I guess this is, you know, this is also a topic. You got to get the move on, man. This chapter's too big to fucking dilly dally. Well, what's tough is, it's honestly tough to narrate, to, like, guide the conversation. It's like, this chapter is just so much. It, like, it's just like, watch two people talk, watch two people talk. And, like, All right, great. Kind of, here, I'll, I'll lead us through some stuff. You ready? It builds to All this right. conversation. We don't like, need to talk about the emissary arriving. Guess what? Kruppa is funny. Wonderful. Wait a, Next. You, you, no, we got to talk about Krupp arriving. Pete's high. Hyped up. What's that? He's here. Krupp's back. Eating pastries. I love the pit when he's like, I'm representing Baruch. You know, he didn't ask me, but I looked in his eyes and I know I knew he was telling me, Krupp, I need you to hit, lead up my emissary. I simultaneously I'm love and hate that character. I'm God so damn. I, agree, into it. I hate him when he's like this. No, I this like is him the- when he's like not annoying. Yeah, no, the, I like the, it when he offers commentary, not when he's trying to, like, expositize a plan, because he takes too long. No, this is the best Krupp, and I That's also That's the love... reason why the chapter is so long. Yes. Because of his stupid, 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 stupid paragraph-long sentences that make no sense about nothing, but apparently mean something because he's brilliant. We get it! I'm sick Thank of you. it. Thank I'm you. Thank you, India. Thank you. Man, we, I, I'm just here. I'm here for it. We, can, we can't just... We can tell, Peter. <laughs> Um, Ask we away, also, Peter. Let's we, discuss. We also see Cole and uh, Council Astrasian DR all again. Um, I love Cole. Couldn't care less about Astrasian DR. Cole rules. Next. Agreed. We, we get a little chalice shot out at one point. Don't um, care. <laughs> she's fine. She's getting married. It's fine. Um. Any who's? And then the, they all meet. And this is when Krupp suggests to use the Trigal Trade Guild to supply the army as they travel south. And he also has, like, a stake in it, because, like, Krupp knows how to play that game. You know, he's getting that bag. He does. He does. He does. That's nice. You got to respect. You got to respect the game. But it's like, are you all so stupid that you don't, like, are, do they just not realize that he's just playing the shit out of all of them? They, no, they fully they, like, realize it, but they it also out. understand it's a good idea. And they're like, fuck, it is and a good idea. It, sh- it should be mentioned Perrin and Cole have, like, like... They're like, oh, remember the lot? like long time to see, and they kind of catch up. You know, it's nice. That was cute. Yeah, that was a cute little scene between them in that book that they were in together. Yeah, Guards of the Moon. <laughs> Correct by the fire. Yeah. That which shall not Half be dead. named. Classic. Classic. Mm-hmm. Me cute. All right. After this, uh, we do see Crone fly off, and we see a reading of the deck of dragons. Josh, how much of this reading did you decipher? None. Next. Nothing. I mean, listen. Okay, great. Fine. I don't know what obelisk is. Okay. It's the first time it's been in here for a while. Sure. Soldier of High House Death. I I don't super know. Now, Magi of Shadow. It's probably Quick Ben. It's my guess. I mean, it's clear that he was... uh, Actually, hey, quick sidebar. Quick sidebar. A thing that has been annoying the shit out of me. Quick quick Ben. Quick, quick, quick Ben sidebar. It's about Quick Ben. It's about Quick Ben. So, I mean, my guess is he's the Magi of Shadow, right? I mean, but here's my question for you. In book one, he visits, what the fuck it's called, Shadow Throne's place, right? Sure. Can you give me an amount of years between Gardens of the Moon and Kellenvid's death? Can you give me that? Oh. I need to know. Um. For a lot of clarification purposes. If I had a physical copy, I mean, it's definitely in Gardens of the Moon for sure. Give, like, give me a second. I mean, it definitely exists. Because what I'm trying to figure out is in when he visits him and then runs away at the end, it is said that Quickbend was a high priest of House Shadow. High House Shadow. 
But how long does has High House Shadow existed that it had high priests in general? Like that, the timeline feels weird to me. So as I know, I didn't need to Google it. Um, it was it's about eight years from the time she Lacine takes the throne to when we read about the Ganabakan campaign. Eighteen years. All right, eight, I guess eight, that's enough eight, time. Eight that's enough years. Eight? That's not enough time. Enough time for what? For there to be like a whole system of priests and high priests and bullshit. Uh, Th- that that is the timeline I am most confused by. Like the time between fucking Kalen Ved dying and the start of Guardians of the Moon. That timeline feels wonky to me. Like it feels like so much happens in not tons of time. So uh, we'll skip uh, a short convers a few conversations are now to talk about when because some logistics are made about how the trade guild are going to get there, about how the Maranth are going to be used as they march towards Kapistan, but. The attention of the camp is drawn when Anamander Rake arrives as a black dragon, black dragon and lands. Everyone gathers. Kalor is like, let's kill Silver Fox. Uh, Kaldan Brood's like, don't you dare draw that weapon. Whiskey Jack is trying to get in there. Everyone draws their weapons. He uses magic. It's a whole... Things are getting real tense. Inge, what do you think about a Kalor prod in the bear... That leads to this whole situation when Animander Rake shows up second one and he's kind of put in this situation of being the judge, so to speak. Why is he to be the judge of this? Bullshit. Second of all, I think that they just need to like let Silver Fox do her thing because she's going to do it anyway and they're, they're, they're not going to kill her. It's just like a big, huge setup. I knew nothing would happen because, come on, this, this child is like the, the, the star of this book so far, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So much. So I agreed, it's just, agreed. Yeah, so I mean, I could have truly, like, I mean, I get it, like, you gotta write about something, but I could have done without this whole scene. Interesting. Um, like, you just felt like the tension wasn't there for you. It, it yeah, like, it wasn't, because I knew uh, something was gonna be said that was gonna diffuse the whole situation. Mm. Um, obviously, because what's gonna happen to this child? I think to me, it more just portrayed, because before we've heard about how tenuous this alliance is, and I think it more portrayed that in, through action, is kind of what I was thinking. Okay, yeah. Fair. Fair points, young Peter. Mm-hmm. I think, I, I think so, I'm think i older than you, India. I don't know what we're no, doing. No, you're not. No, you're not. I was <laughs> born in May. All right. Yeah, okay. you fucking June baby. Wait, what day in May, India? I'm in May also. The 30th. Oh, I'm 17th. I'm the oldest. I'm uh-huh. like, oh my god. Anyway, back to the show. Fucking the June tenth, boy, younger. June tenth over here. This is you. a matter of days, a smattering <laughs> of days. All right, back to okay. It. Yeah, um, Anna Rake was really quick to like draw his freaking sword because um, little Silver Fox is like, get out of my head, man. This is not your place. Mm-hmm. Which I think is kind of rude because, like, who are you to to be snooping around in my business like that? It's the so son I'm of Silver darkness. Fox in that way. But I I really appreciated when it was all said and done when Caladan Brood was like talking like you guys are so this was so unnecessary and it's obvious that we should just wait to make mm-hmm. any decisions. I thought that mm-hmm. was kind of funny. Yeah, I think I like it too when you when you, you learn more about Caladan Brood. Well, when you kind of learn about the power of the hammer and blah blah blah. Um, total chiller, especially with this. Absolutely. He's like, we everyone needs to take five. Calor, you need to chill out. Here's the Snickers bar. <laughs> you know, Josh, how'd you feel about this confrontation? Or almost? Uh, I think about the same as India. It felt like a lot of fucking like chest chest pumping for nothing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, fucking dudes being dudes, bros being bros, trying to become the dominant. But like, why do we need to? Clearly, this guy has a sword that eats souls. He doesn't need to fucking like have a contest with people. But like, did we learn about like? I don't want to just say it. Actually, why, why don't I just say it? But this uh, hammer that Caladan Brood has. Oh pretty, yeah, the hammer is crazy. Pretty lit as well. So. Yeah. Did not expect it to be an earth-shattering hammer in his Which hands. Which kind of makes sense as to why they speak more like equals, I feel. <laughs> yeah. Question. So, it, is it... Uh, I, am I reading these hints right? Is Kaladin Brood known for, like, potentially, like, insane rages where he just fucking destroys people? I missed that. Because he was... I don't know. There was, like, a one or two sentence thing where he was, like... He talks about not wanting to use the hammer for fear of, like, going too far or something. Well, I, like, I is he constantly just, like, barely hitting people? Because if he actually hit someone and, and hit the ground, he would just fucking shatter the earth. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that the point of the hammer? Uh, yeah, yeah to, think... wake, to wake burn, but that would free the crippled god. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of what Jin said. You know, I don't, I, I don't know if it's 
yeah, I think it's kind of discussed. It's about waking burn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get into that. So we kind of learn all about all of this. And then additionally, we learn about, um, we see the hold of beasts when Perrin is kind of briefly drawn towards this conflict. And then he kind of falls into the Azath house and we see raced again. How the um, hell did that happen? No, I don't know. I, I, we're not going to know India. Sorcery. It's just- it happened yeah. out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so we learn a lot here, and it's in such a strange way. And, and once again, Perrin is uh, refusing the call to become this master of the deck. India, how did you feel about being in the Azath house again since the last time we were here kind of in that flood of the ending of Gardens of the Moon? The Azath house, to me, seems like when you see a small house on the outside and then you go inside and it's freaking huge. Yeah. Um, that's That was my first thought, obviously. Like I it's thought got race deceiving was hilarious. portions. <laughs> oh, race, is, race, got, race got goofs. I was like, when were you funny? Yeah. So that he, was was, too, he was too busy trying to destroy the world last time. Yeah, yeah. Now that he, he's just bored now, so he has time. So I thought that was great. Um, when he goes down, 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 um, I, and that's when he like truly learns the shit, like, you know, the world's going to end, bro, one way or another. Mm-hmm. What does he have to do with anything? What does him being a, a card have to do with anything? Uh, I, 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 he's going to become, he's the, the king of the deck or whatever, master like, of the deck. Tell me what that means to me right now. And nothing, why, India, how can nothing. you even I don't ask think, me anything I don't, about I, this? I don't think it means anything to us just yet. I think it's going to like, because the deck of dragons is still just such, such a fucking weird thing for us. Like only in book three. I don't know, India. And like, if I don't know about it, do you know about it, Perrin? Because like, you're being real, real upset about something that truly do we all. That's true. That's true. He doesn't even know what they're asking of him. And he's like, how dare they ask that of me? Oh, so I mean, like it's confirmed for like the 17th time now since everybody's been saying it for this whole chapter. So like, thanks for telling me officially, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, cool. Sucks, I guess. Well, we also. Yeah. Well, yeah. It is that, then he finds out. Doesn't he find out a little bit more about the burn sleeping goddess? Yeah, yeah. you kind of learn about, we talked about a little bit of the hammer and that like if he were to use it, it would free the crippled god, but then everyone yeah. would die. The and crippled then, god wins either way. Yeah. Truth. And then we also see the the what used to be the seat of the Amasa's power before the ritual of the Talon with the twin thrones. Correct. Jo- no idea. Any thoughts from you, Josh? Yeah, there's definitely a queen or a king or some bullshit we don't know about yet. There's two gods for them. I don't know. Well, no, we know of one thing. Like, I think they were saying that, like, they know that there's one thing that should be in one of the thrones. I can't remember who or what. But he is, like, he's like, but should I? What what could be in the second throne? And it's, like, another one. I don't know. What? I don't know. So, we'll see. Yeah, well, I don't have much on that. Well, when he comes to, he's once again in the mix of it, uh, and uh, this is that's when you kind of see the the standoff die uh, die away. But afterwards, we see the Mibe kind of flee, and she is uh, contemplating ending her own life as uh, she feels she has grown to hate her child, and this is taking a toll on her. Uh, she is stopped by Corlat. But India, how did you feel about seeing the Mibe throughout this chapter and this kind of climax of her sorrow in this scene? Her life is freaking stressful. So, you know, I just feel for that girl. <clears throat> She's, what, 20? And she looks, like, dead at this point. She yeah, can't it's rough. do anything. It's, rough. it's Her child is now apparently, like... Um, or so she said, taking up more of her now in an effort to grow faster for whatever reason she's trying to do it. She has no idea. I, I think they say that Silver Fox has grown five years in the yeah, span yeah, of these the chapters. Yeah, by the end of this, she has to be 15, which means, you know, she's getting older. What? Is that real? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck. So, and that's only been, it I mean, seems a couple like days, a maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So, and, and it took her six months to grow to 10. So it yeah. seems like it becomes r- more rapid. Or she's either, or she doesn't realize what she's doing. But regardless of that, she wants to kill herself, and I get it. I mean, so would I. That sounds freaking awful. To it, just, it it really does. Like, and I and it's so it's also like noble as shit for her to be like, I want to die so I don't grow to hate my daughter. Like, fuck, but that's also brutal. I'm freaking miserable. So yeah, brutal. Um. So like, I get that. 
I feel bad for her because then Corlat comes and is like, ha, 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 no, you don't. And she How kind of makes it seem she? like she's doing it for her. But like, for me, it's like, you're just protecting this kid's life force. So that Interesting. is my yeah. thought on it. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm so much like more ready to torturing her to be alive. You're not doing this because you like her. You're doing it like, because if yeah. you like, like, I don't know. I what guess is I just... Life? I mean, I more read it as like, I don't know, like as a, a legitimate intervention, you know? Initially, like, I read it as that, but like, for what? So she because, like, she has no quality of life at this point. She's yeah, miserable like, and she hates her freaking kid. But like saving lives is good, so. I agree, P, but I don't think that's the case here. But you read the book, so you would know. But I just feel like, okay, you die now. That Where is she getting any more, and like, life force from where is it going to come from will she be and then my thing is if she does die does she just stay 15 because if that's the case i think they're going to cut her off around 21 so that she's like you know of mm-hmm. like hot young age <laughs> but still a woman so I, 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 I guess so i have i've n- you never read the books josh do you have anything to say about that nope well do then you agree josh do you agree with me or do you agree with peter that's what i, I with india know. i always agree with india thank you that's- that's not true. Sometimes you've agreed with me. I can't think of it right now, but like maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe. Oh, oh, fucking got him. Earlier, Talk and Tool speak a bit about the past that Animator Rake and Caladum Brood share as ascendants. Mm. Uh, mm. And here, I got we, it. And here okay. we see the two of them together speaking about a variety of things, including Silver Fox and the Panadian Domain. So but, uh, here's my here's my thoughts. Okay. Have you watched all of Naruto Shippuden? No, I haven't. So, in Naruto Shippuden, there's this theme of two guys, and, like, they are two, so these two spirits keep getting reborn every generation. There's always, like, the hothead who's, like, fighting for good, and then the cool, calm, collected one who's maybe his morals are dubious, right? It happens generation after generation. I really got strong Naruto Shippuden vibes from thinking about Kaladin Brood and Anime Rake, and they start talking about this Queen of Dreams, who I think must have traveled with them, although I believe that Lady Envy also traveled with them, yes? And uh. it really feels like the new generation version of our boys, Cruel, and the other two, <laughs> whose names I've completely forgotten. Do you know what I'm other... talking about? The three the three elder gods? Oh, from the very, very beginning. From the very beginning. What were their two names? Dra- Draconir? Draconis, Kral, Draconis. And then there was... Uh, uh, so a third one. Yeah. I can't remember her name. But I, I really feel like thinking about them, I'm like, this is the new, this was the new power trio. Now, they've been separated for a little bit, but like, it, it seems interesting that there's like a, this, a, a second crew of like highly powerful people who are intertwined with like the fate of the crippled god and with Kalor and stuff. So I don't know. I found that interesting. It's the, sister, it, it's the sister of cold nights and the for sister the record, of cold she's nights, not an elder right? And now we have the queen of dreams. It keeps being ladies who don't get real names. Um, and I'm very interesting if that has any, if there's any connections between the two trios, that would be sick. There probably isn't. I'm probably just like making something up that's nothing, but it would be very cool. However, I also didn't expect Anime Narrate and Kaladin Brood to be just kind of boys. Like I didn't think they'd be like, yo, what's up? It's oh, us. They're, fu- they're full bro in it out. They're bro- they bro out. It's pretty great. Especially Anime Rake. That dude's cold. Like, it's nice to see him not be so, uh, morbid, pessimistic, you know, any of those words. Put a smile on that face. That's all anyone's trying to do, buddy. No. So, uh, Indy, do you have anything to say about the two of them? Uh, no. They go back a long time. They're bros. It's, it's cute. Love it. Then let me put this to you. In one of the final scenes of the chapter, we see Perrin, and, you know, his tummy's hurting, and he doesn't want to be the deck of dragons. Blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 go- I'm gonna My sneeze, tummy. I think. <laughs> Um, we have really just gone hard on Perrin this to this episode. Hey, but no, he earned, he I was de- I was defending Perrin. I'm pro him feeling his feelings. You know, that's fine. You can be pro can him being a little baby. Want. He's just a little baby, and if you want that, it's fine. Don't call him a little baby. He's depressed. He's just a little yeah. baby. Okay, he has all right. He has, I think he's having mental health problems. I don't think it's fair I, to he's say he's having a tummy ache. A, yeah. a, okay, I don't know if that's fair either. You know. <laughs> Whatever. He, Peter, like what the, the, bl- the blood of the Hounds of Shadows. Anyway, so at the end of this chapter, we see uh, Kalor yelling at Whiskey Jack, and then he gets put in a hole. So let me just ask you, especially after all the trouble he causes in this chapter, what's your mood on Kalor being a part of this army headed south? Well, he seems to be um, a bit of a impulsive person. 
He doesn't really listen to anyone but himself, which I think could be proved to be a bit problematic when you're with a bunch of people trying not to get everyone killed. And chances are, the people that you're going to deal with might not agree with you. So, I don't know. I think that he's going to get into some stupid shit, and some people that we like are going to die as a result of war. That's how I feel. And Josh? Fuck Calor. He sucks. So that's all I got. He's kind of, he seems real shitty. Agreed. Yeah, that's basically my opinion. And they start headed south. I think Whiskey Jack reaches out to the cell swords in Kepistan that were yes. hired by the prince there. Yes. Um, India, do you want to read the summary for the next chapter? It depends, Peter. You know I hate reading. <laughs> Let me give it a look over. It's it's not as long. It's not a trick. You know, it's just all that gruntle stuff, you know. <sighs> no, no, I don't. Let's cut all this then. <laughs> <laughs> chapter 6. In Saltoan, the caravan escorted by Gruntle arrives. The guards relax at a bar as Cruelly negotiates with the crime lords of the city. Gruntle hears of the Tenescauri, a cannibalistic army driven by the Paninian Daman, along with the rape of corpses giving birth to the children of the dead seed. Cruelly urges these crime lords to resist, and Gruntle recalls perhaps that Cruelly is a priest of an unknown god. After speculating about a new set of murders here in Saltoan, they learn the guards and Kuruli will be traveling south to Kapistan. The caravan sets out. Gruntle, searching for bandits, finds only bandit corpses, blackened and killed. On the road, Kuruli wishes to befriend a trio of nearby Bargast. Hetan and her siblings join the company and will travel towards Kapistan. That night, Brentel and Hetan are the last awake and speak of the demons that have been attacking the Bargast and desecrating their ancestral sites. Afterwards, they sleep together. On the road once more, they speak about the Bargast people. They then see Botchlin's carriage damaged on the road. They examine it and can see inside. Gruntle can see a trunk open, revealing stone slabs and human organs sewn together in what looks like necromancy. Two sorcerers and their manservant return to the carriage. The duo were meddling with a Bargast barrow, which offends Hetan. Gruntle speaks with Hetan, and although they are leery, the group will travel together towards Kapustan. They return to offer this to the duo, who have used a stick snare to begin tracking undead that have been released. Gruntle asks why the duo are traveling this way, and they say they are but natural travelers. Further down the road, they make camp, and Hedden takes Harlow as a partner for the night. Stormy follows suit with a different Bargast. Botchlin warns that undead are approaching. The group readies themselves, and Karuli says he is a priest of an elder god. Out from the shadows, massive undead reptiles emerge with swords for arms. They are Kachain Chamale hunters that serve their matron. The group battle the five Kel hunters, and there is a sorcerous melee. A sixth hunter emerges, marked with steel spikes, and attacks the guard, Gruntle. Gruntle falls on the ground, and the hunter digs into his chest. And he sees darkness. All right, India, this whole chapter is Gruntle top to bottom, but it starts in Saltoan as he trades rumors in the bar about Cruelly and learns more about the Peninian Domain's Tenescalry army before they start traveling south to Kapistan. What do you feel about learning all this new information? I guess the word that comes to mind is horrified. Sounds about right. Um, this is This is some next-level bullshit, and I... I don't know how to feel about any of <clears throat> these these children and and the way that they are birthed and uh I don't know I don't really as the chapter pro- progresses um I don't really understand like what what this means because I don't like I'm I'm not sure <laughs> what are we going to meet these people did we meet them already I just don't understand we haven't met them yet. Okay, because I couldn't... Who, who have we the, not met or have met? Anyone from the Penny and Daman. Oh, nope, nope, nothing yet. So, okay, so then these uh, Bargast people are just 
random people that we meet along the way that are also freaking strange. Yeah, they're local people on the oh. continent that are oh. also, you know, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, I feel un- I feel uncomfortable with these people, and I don't want to meet them, and I hope that we don't because they seem insane. Um, I would like I'd like to meet them maybe like later, way down the line. Chapter eight. Two chapters from now. Book eight. <laughs> oh, book. <laughs> because the, I don't, I just don't get. I I don't understand where they're they're even gonna fit. Because I get it, they're from the Penin to Peninian Domain, but like, is everyone like that? Is it just one group of people? And why I think are they... they're well. They said they're Kashan Shamao, which are like the race. So indeed, remember in the beginning, there's like the tear, the rift, and those two kids get thrown in there, yes. right? Do you remember that from the beginning? Okay. And then when Talk first wakes up and meets Lady Envy, she says that those barrows held Kachin Shamal and like a Kachin Shamal mother and her kids and that yeah. the shift in the in the rift's power or something caused them to be unleashed. So this is one of the four founding races that have been dead for like they're the ones that they thought none were left. And now we're learning that you know they came out of there but also these are Kachin Shamal attacking currently and like we have not seen these because we've assumed they've been dead for like centuries now. So they're so the Pania oh. Dimin's not like the opinion means mostly humans, but it looks like they are they have Kichan Shamal under their control or something like that. We don't know the details yet. Okay, fair. Yeah, Josh was like on, on point. Cool. Um and uh I, I you know, I just want to take the opportunity. I know we don't really see them till later, but um I love the Kachin Shamal. I think they're wild, dreamy beasts to be in these books. Yeah, there there's something right now. <laughs> um and they're very unique, and I've always appreciated them. I love the good dreamy beast. They got swords for arms, you know. Um, Josh, uh, after they leave Saltoan is when they first meet uh, the trio of Bargast, you know? And mm-hmm. I think this is our first time seeing and learning a little more about Bargast culture. How did that strike you? Uh, you've mistaken the Bargast for Trells maybe several a times. dozen times on several, the podcast. Several, several times, yes. Um, I very much enjoyed them. I don't know, just like the whole, the whole like you as the female one grabs a man and is just like we're fucking now. That is some, that is some like bold stuff. Pretty and, and very funny to me. That's that was like the that was the main thing that that I was just like this is so fucking wild. I don't know. They're they're cool. I like them very much. I would like to see more of their society. Yeah. And I'm very now. I am now very curious. Now Trotz is bargast or part bargast. Trotz is Bargast, and we didn't talk about it in the last chapter, but it's noted he's that... He's being sent. He's... Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, the bridge, banner, bridge burners are headed south by Black Moranth to... Uh, Trotz is leading an envoy to the Bargast. Then right. they're supposed to march south on to meet the rest of the army in Kepistan. Yeah. I, I don't know. I thought it was really cool. Um, I'm excited to... I don't, I'm excited to get to see his interaction, and I'm very curious... Because it doesn't seem like these three Bargast, it from what I'm getting from them, it doesn't seem like they care to interact with human mu- humans much. So I'm very curious what brought Trotz to the Bridge Burners. I'm very curious if we find that out. Yeah, he's been more talkative this book, too. He has, he has. Um, in after this, we see the Corbel Brooch and Botchland's caravan has been attacked. And uh, we get a little more insight when we see a little, some human organs sprayed out. Yeah. Uh, we- oh, yeah. So... They do magic with dead people. Seems that way. Disturbing. But it yeah. makes sense. But did they murder the people? Or did the demons murder the people? Or both? What do you think, Josh? bakalin has been murdering people. Not Bakalin, the other one. Cor- what's his name? Corbel Corbel- Brooch. Corbel, Corbel Brooch. Brooch. Corbel Brooch has been murdering people a bunch. And probably, and it's, it seems like they're necromancers, so he's harvesting their organs for like magic and shit. Yes. Okay. But, but demons are also killing people. Um, the demons attacked them last night and did not manage to kill any of them, but came very close. Yeah, and the demons, I think... Are the Kachin Shamal. That's what yeah, they were called. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they thought yes. they were demons, but they are the Kachin Shamal. The large yeah. alligators with sword hands. Yes, love that image, <laughs> India. Love that image. Thank you. Very they're powerful. More, they're more raptor-esque, but, like, alligators nope. are very... Nope, alligators, <laughs> done. That's in my head now forever. <laughs> That's what I've been seeing in my head, so... Big old alligators with head with with sword arms. Yeah, on a, walking on two legs, no less. Well, speaking of them, it's at night that we they attack and that we see really the first glimpses of them. I mentioned my love for them earlier, Josh. How was this uh, fight scene for you, and how did it, uh, it strike you to see these beasts? Well, 
I mean, the thing that annoys me sometimes, and I know it's good storytelling, is that we see these incredible fights almost always from the eyes of a fucking mortal who just gets their ass beat mercilessly. Yeah. And so when I'm like, we're going to see this awesome fight, and then it's like, wait, shit, we're seeing it through Gruntle. And like, listen, Gruntle's got two cutlasses, and that's that's some that's some powerful energy he's bringing. He is also a mortal, frail human who just gets fucking bopped in a minute, like <laughs> like less than a yeah. minute, like in like the first two, eight seconds. It's like cool shit happening, cool shit happening. Those javelins came out of nowhere. Fuck that one guy up. There's a dude behind me. Bop! Just flies like forty feet, and he's out. Like, come on. I want to see the rest of the fight. He's just a dude, though, you know. Yeah, so let me watch it through the fucking necromancer's <laughs> eyes. My my thing is these kaching chaba la la la. Listen, India, however we say it is fine cuz that is some bolt that's some fucked up spelling if I've ever seen it. Yeah, it's uncool, yeah, can't lie. I agree with that. <laughs> so, they're not working on their own volition. They're being controlled by some- maybe. Like that I think that's a very solid guess, but we do not know that in the slightest. Okay. I feel that way because I just don't, I don't get what, why <laughs> I'm missing the why and all this. I do feel bad for Grundle though. He did not deserve that. Now yeah, Grundle's a cool dude. Uh, I, for, it's Gruntle with a T for the record. Let the record show. Gruntle. I gotta say it was such a long reading, especially that central chapter, which a lot happened in, but maybe it didn't like not a lot necessarily happened. You know, it was a lot of mm, characters discussing and, and feeling stuff. I don't know. It was, I felt like we were able to talk about it pretty quickly, actually. Two hours, not bad. Considering not bad. it was like a seven-hour read. Yeah, that's I don't, that's what I mean. It's Well, let me ask the two of you this before we, we close out the show. Out of these, mm, let's say four-ish storylines, you know? I don't know. There's a lot. Ish. So you, you can pick whatever you want. What, what are you most excited to follow into the rest of the book out of these storylines? Ooh. Hmm. India, do you got one? Um, I don't want to say my generic answer, so I want to think of something that I'm like even more interested about. I think I'm really excited to see the tool talk Lady Envy line. Um, like that one seems so far from everyone because everyone else we've met is going to be coming to the Panion Domain from the north, and these guys are going to be the only ones arriving from the south. So they're definitely going to get a view of things that the others aren't. So I'm really excited that, for what they see. Yeah, and you, India. Um, so, you know, I love the maybe, the maybe, the mybe lover, but I guess I have to say I'm more interested in, like, the larger plot here of what they're going to do about this whole, uh, sleeping goddess and oh damn the yeah god i'm very very intrigued at how they're gonna figure out this situation of what do we, what's the lesser of two evils here yeah mm. well i'm excited to crack into the rest of the book with it mm-hmm. um i think for me thank you for asking i always appreciate you turning around on me like that josh <laughs> um uh <laughs> I, I think I agree with you. I, I think this time around, I'm excited to read about uh, the talk set of characters because, uh, I don't know, I it just wasn't, my head was so in the north with the military campaign the first time I read the book. Mm. Um, anywho's, well, send us, a, send us an email, of course. We're 10 very big books. Same on Twitter. Uh, let us know what we got wrong. I'm sure we got something wrong today. Oh, I shouldn't have asked that. No, no, of course, no, <laughs> please. <laughs> no, please. Talk Anything. soon. Talk soon. Yeah, that's it. Every week, I say, like, we should think of a better outro. And we just... If you have ideas for an outro for us, hit us up. <laughs> Let us know. Twitter, honestly, at very, so 10 Very Big Books. I do mostly feel that way. Well, I just ask you a closing thing. You don't even make predictions, you know? Yeah, no. Yeah. All right. Ooh, Goodbye. Bye. bye. I'm hitting stop oh. on the recording. Bye. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Producer AJ here reminding you to please wash your hands. Uh, Let me just start off by saying that this has been the best season premiere we've had out of our three seasons. Usually the episodes take about a month to reach 1,500 listeners, but you got us to 1,600 in 
two weeks. So thank you so, so much for listening and sharing the show. We truly will never be able to thank the community enough. Speaking of community, the Very Big Books Discord server is live. We've been live just under a week, and the discussion and growth there is off to a great start. So head on over there. If you don't know what Discord is, it's basically just a big chat room where you can talk to other people who like the show. Now, you can check that out at bit.ly slash VBB Discord. Uh, that will also be in the show notes. And as always, thank you so much to Dan Gezerk for making our spectacular logo. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Gezerk for even more hockey stuff. Look, it, it's almost playoff season. And of course, the wonderful music in today's episode is by the one and only Amaranthan from their album Simulant Rain, which you can find along with their other music on Bandcamp.com. Links to their pages will be in the show notes and 10 very big books. We'll be back in two weeks on March 20th with chapters 7, 8, and 9 of Memories of Ice. Talk to you then, and thank you so much for listening. And his sister Felison sent to the Otateral Mines. That's how Steve does it, you know? Boom! What's up? Thanks, Steve.